Hello everyone and welcome to Bible Study at St. Paul from St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. This is Revelation 20 and I am, I guess, your host or your teacher, or whatever you want to call me in this medium, um, Vicar Josh. And today we are covering chapter 20 of Revelation. So we're going to dive right into it. But before we get to the text itself, I, I want to introduce the chapter a little bit. Um, and talk a little bit about chapter 19. So in chapter 19, we saw this incredible scene where there was worship and praise of God. There was this final battle. Um, and what's really interesting and what's kind of important for our discussion of chapter 20 is it is distinct from chapter 19. It, it is separate. Um, in the way we walk through it, it, it is going to talk about um, Satan and his punishment, the final victory of him, his imprisonment, uh, some some different things with that, which we'll obviously get to as we walk forward. If you're curious and you want to go back to 19, that video is available. Just go to St. Paul's YouTube page. All of the Revelation studies are on there. Um, they even have their own playlist. It's labeled Revelation Bible Study, so you can check that out. Um, if you would like to get caught up. So with that, we're going to walk into Revelation 20, um, going just a few verses at a time. What I would encourage you to do is to have a Bible in front of you. Um, I, I do, I will be putting the, the words that I'm reading up on the screen as I'm reading them, but as we walk through the text, I, I'm going to take those down and, and have this video discussion with you. So, it helps to have that text in front of you, whether it is a, a literal Bible or it is on your phone, um, so that as I make references to different parts of the text, it's easier for you to see what I'm talking about. So, without further ado, let's get into the first three verses of Revelation, and that is, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So that's the, the text we're stepping into today. And what is really interesting and important to point out here is that John, as he's writing this, as he's being instructed to write this, he doesn't make any mention of time or uh, any, any comment to the sequential nature of chapter 20. And that's a bit of a, a departure from what he does in, in the earlier chapters of Revelation, where a lot of times he'll, he'll preface each kind of step in this narrative with, and after this happened, this happened. And after this happened, this happened. But here, the, there's no transition like that. Um, so what is, I, I think, fair and, and reasonable to then say is that these events that we're about to walk through, they don't necessarily follow the events chronologically of chapter 19. And in fact... There's a lot of evidence to say that, like there was earlier in Revelation, there it, it's we're, we're stepping out of the, the rest of the story of Revelation to look at kind of an overarching narrative. Earlier in Revelation, there, there was a brief period where it stepped out into this overarching narrative that spoke to the beginning of time, before, before humanity was created, or while the process... Of, to Satan's initial rebellion against God and him being cast down. And then uh, in that same chapter, it talks about Jesus and his victory on earth. And then it talks about the, the ultimate victory at the end of time. And, and we kind of get that overarching narrative in the midst of this smaller story about just the end of the world. And I suspect, and I think the, the, the best understanding of chapter 20 is that it is a very similar thing. It is stepping out of the chronology of Revelation to give us a, a bigger picture of what's going on. So, as we walk into the events that then happen, the, the devil, the dragon, the ancient serpent, Satan, is bound for a thousand years. 
the abyss will be shut with Satan inside it. And and this there's this clarification about this this chain being a great chain, a heavy chain. Um, and one of the reasons I think that that distinction is made is because there's there's this connotation with you know the angel's the one carrying the chain. It's a great chain. It probably has it, it it's from God. It's not just an ordinary uh, shackle, I guess. And that's important because if you go to the New Testament, you see stories of demons that Jesus cast out, but before he cast them out, they could break chains. They were chained up and the demon broke the chains. So there, there is that clarification and it's made intentionally here. So, um... That's a tangent. I got a tangent for you. Um, the only other reference in Scripture to Satan being bound, and this is one of the reasons that the suspicion is that this is kind of a, a overarching narrative, is that the only other mention of Satan being bound is when Jesus is responding to the Pharisees. The Pharisees accuse him of casting out demons in the name and by the power of Satan. And Jesus says that's dumb essentially he says it much kinder and much more eloquently and but he says that's dumb okay um and then he talks about this idea of the strong man and no one robs the strong man's house unless he first ties up the strong man um and it's kind of weird to think about but the the strong man here is satan who is being chained up and then the thief is representative of jesus coming in and taking us back um, so that's kind of the distinction that's being made here. Um, so when we look at this, Satan is being bound here. This is, this is referring by all indications to Jesus and his ministry, to Jesus and his work. Um, so we see that and we see it's kind of part way through the story, but then as we walk forward through this, we're going to see, um, different chronologies that that again leads this to think that this is an overarching narrative um so we we walk forward and it says he's bound for a thousand years this i i cannot be clear enough this is not a specific period of earthly history we are not looking for some magical start date and a thousand years of our time later this all happens um that's not what this is. The only other two biblical references to a thousand years are in Psalm and 1 Peter. And in Psalm it's saying a thousand years are like a day gone by. And in 2 Peter it's a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So based on all the other uses of a thousand years and that time period in scripture, it seems to be kind of just representative of a long time because... God is above and outside and in control of time as we know it. So it when we talk about these thousand years where the devil is bound, it's probably just referring to a lengthy period of time. And he's bound so that he cannot prevent the work of the church. So what we frequently refer to this 1,000 years, this thousand year period, this lengthy period of time is the church age. The, the era of the church where the church is going out with the gospel of Christ, winning people for him, bringing people to kneel before his throne. And the devil is being bound so he cannot inhibit that work directly. But there is a clarification to be made but that comes from earlier in Revelation where he still has servants in the world that are acting on his behalf. And if you want the discussion of that, you can go back and watch like the last six videos. Um... So, that's the first three verses. We're going to step forward into Revelation 20, verse 4, and we're going to go all the way to verse 6. And what that says is, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw, also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their forehead or hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over the second death, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, those reigning with Christ in this period is, is what it's talking about, in this church age. And it, it seems that when you first read this, at least when I first read this, this the first impression I get is that these three kind of descriptions that he has going forward refer to, it, they're all referenced to the same group. It, he's, he's describing the same group three different ways. Um, but the more I studied it and the more I looked into it, it seems more likely that these are three distinct groups that are all with Christ and reigning during this period. So you have those who are sitting on the throne with authority. And that's one. And then you have those who have suffered martyrdom. And, and John uses the word here, beheaded. And the reason that this probably isn't just symbolic of those who suffer for the name of Christ is beheaded is a very specific word. In Greek, in English, in, in Aramaic, I imagine in most languages, beheaded is, is a very specific word. So if he was just talking about suffering, he probably would have used a more general word. So... That's one of the reasons we kind of distinguish. There are those who sit on the throne, then there are those who stu suffered martyrdom in that way, and then there are those who don't worship the beast and don't have the mark on his head. And those are three groups, which in reality kind of refers to all of God's saints. Because all of God's saints don't worship the beast and haven't accepted his mark. Um, so this, this could, and this probably is, three separate groups all reigning with God. Um, as we continue, I'm sorry I say um a lot. Like, I'm very conscious of it because I hear myself saying it over and over again. I, time out from the Bible study. I want to apologize for that. Um, and I did it again. It's my filler word. Everyone has, as someone who worked in radio for four years, everyone has them. And once you notice yours, it drives you nuts. So, let's continue. Sorry about that tangent on how frustrated I am with patterns of diction. It talks about uh, the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. And what we generally understand this as is this first resurrection that's referred to is a spiritual resurrection. And then the second is physical. The second resurrection is the new creation. And then it goes forward and it talks about this second death. The second death has no power over those who are spiritually resurrected. And the second death refers to the lake of fire. It refers to being cast into hell. So there's this reality that once once God's saints are spiritually resurrected, hell cannot touch them. And, and that's the, the next several verses. That's four through six. Um, and it continues with as it kind of has this promise of salvation and of safety for God's people, it continues to the fate of Satan. And that's what we're going to, what we're going to look like in, look at in verses 7 through 10. Which say, When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. So, as we walk forward, we see the fate of Satan. He is released and um, he had previously, and we see this in previous chapters in Revelation, he had worked with the two beasts, with uh, the false prophet and, and the, the first beast is generally just how it's referred to. Um, but now he is released to work directly for a period of time. And what we see is he gathers from the four corners of the earth. That means all nations, they're, they're being arrayed against God. They're gathering against God's people and surrounding the holy city. The church would have been annihilated. God's faithful people would have been annihilated if not for God's intervention here. And we see he casts fire down and he casts Satan and his followers into the lake of fire, into hell, 
where their suffering is eternal. So in, in the first kind of section of Revelation 20, we see the victory for God's people and the safety and security for God's people. And then in the next, in this next little section that we just read, we see the, the ultimate defeat and punishment for the enemies of God. And that's what we see in, in these three verses. And then it transitions into the last few verses, um, again, to kind of this final vision of victory and judgment. So that's what we're going to see in verses 11 through 15. And it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not written, not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So here we kind of see this final judgment. We see God sitting on his throne. The church has finished the mission. The creation is being renewed. And the dead are, are being judged. And I, I kind of have two things I want to talk about here. One, I want to direct, direct jump directly to the end where it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the pit of fire. So what this does is this talks about kind of this ultimate judgment of heaven versus hell. And all those whose names are found in the book of the light of book of life are in heaven, and those whose names are not in the book of life are in hell. So we have this judgment, but it it also talks about and this is the the beginning of the passage. These are where the verses would kind of just naturally follow about the books were opened and what was written in the books was what they had done, and they're judged according to that. Um, so there is this, what our deeds are not what keep us in heaven or send us to hell. It is our names in the book of life, which comes by faith given to us by the Holy Spirit. Which begs the question, well, what is this other, why, why are the other books being opened? Why is judgment being done according to their works? And this could be something as... And at this point, I'm kind of just guessing. So this is this is out of the realm of knowledge. This is into the realm of speculation. So what I would speculate is Jesus speaks a couple times toward things like the first will be last and the last will be first. So it might be that kind of judgment for those who are within heaven. And whatever that judgment looks like, I don't I don't know what it looks like, but that's something that I think this this more speaks to is not a judgment to heaven or hell, but a judgment kind of within the ranks of heaven by God for whatever reason he has uh, dictated. But then we see we see death and Hades, they are cast out. The, the book of life is the final source of judgment. If you aren't there, you're cast into the lake of fire along with Satan and his servants and death and Hades. So here we see the ultimate victory of Christ where death and hell and the devil are cast out forever, and his people who are written in the book of life are saved. So that is that is what we close chapter 20 on, and I think compared to some of the previous chapters we've done, that's a pretty hopeful place to close the passage. Um, but we're getting toward the end. We have two more chapters of Revelation, and, and that is all. And then this study will be complete. Um, at which point I will, I believe, start going back and filling in the gaps. I know I, uh, I've i been slacking a little bit on that, but uh, turns out doing, doing virtual ministry is a lot more effort than one would think. And uh, so I, I will catch up. Not to make excuses, I will catch up. Um, you have my word on that. So with that, if you have any more questions or comments or concerns for the good of, of anyone who watches this video... I would encourage you, please, comment below. I, I would love to hear them. I'd love to respond to them. Um, I'll, I'll try to get to them if I can. Uh, 
sometimes my YouTube account is weird and makes comments disappear. But um, anyway, uh, and if you need anything, if you need anything, don't don't hesitate to reach out to St. Paul. Um, we have those St. Paul Cares teams that they are assembled and ready to go. They are just waiting for people to help. So um, if you could use help, if you need help, please send Pastor Steve an email. You can send me an email. You can call the church office. You, However you need to let us know. Um, what I would also encourage you to do, and this is my last plug before I'm going to let you go, uh, below this video there's a button that says subscribe, unless you're already subscribed, and then it, I believe it says unsubscribe. Um, if there is the button that says subscribe, I would say go ahead and click it because then you'll be notified when these Bible studies come out, when Pastor Andrew's Bible studies come out, when daily devotions come out, when um, worship services go live. You'll get all of this and it'll be right in your, the, your YouTube feed, I guess, and that's what, that's what you want. That's one of the ways that it, it becomes a little easier for you to get into touch with God's Word. So that is the button below or toward the end of the video. It will appear in one of the top corners. I don't know which one because sometimes the video gets flipped. But one of these top corners is the subscription. One of these is the playlist of these videos or the next video, depending on when you're watching this video. So that's all I have for you. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.